Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to our listeners, and welcome to anyone that's now viewing us on YouTube as well. Um, very happy to say we've got another episode today and another guest lined up. Um, so today we've got Carrick Stanwick here with us. Um, thank you for coming along. Uh, sure. First question, as always, I mean, people are going to get sick of this. I know that John is. Um, but first question, as always, is kind of give us a little bit of background <laughs> about you, where you started, how your career kind of panned out, and what you're doing today. Sure. So I have a little bit of an atypical background. Actually uh, started in the military in the intel field. Uh, after I did my military tour, I got out and stayed as a contractor, which gave me uh, 10 more years of intel experience. Ultimately transitioned into cyber and found that uh, having a human intelligence background was far more translatable than I anticipated. After all, what we're dealing with is more of a human problem, less a technical problem these days, right? Started yeah. off at the, in government with the Department of Agriculture. Uh, doing SOC operations. Ultimately, from there, moved into uh, H&R Block, where I was, had the opportunity to build a, a ground-up program, which was incredible. Uh, ultimately, from there, moved to a startup called Wave Financial in Toronto, which was really the trifecta. It gave me experience with government, with enterprise, and with startup, and really gave me a some pretty unique perspectives on the differences and the challenges that each of those face. And currently I've been at Avnet for about a year. So we are a, a fortune 200 uh, supply chain company dealing with electronics. So I have a question before I let John say anything, cause I always tend to hog, hog the mic. Um, we speak to a lot of people on the podcast that have come out of the military and, and have kind of found themselves in, in it or, or specifically in cyber. Why do you think that is? Why do you think it kind of fits so well? I think on the sock side of the house, uh, I've seen the same thing, especially. Maybe less so in my experience on the governance side. But if you think about it, I mean, incident response is not that much different. It's just the digital version of what we were doing in the army. And, and my experience is that those who have had some more of those real life incident experience, whether it was army, whether it's police, uh, detectives. Uh, one of my rock star hires at H and R Block was an undercover narcotics officer previously. Right, the the ability to handle the the response without getting overly emotional, without going off the deep end, keeping your head. A lot of those are traits that I think are built and and refined through the military type programs, whether it's military or law enforcement or other programs like that. Yeah, I, I was going to say because. It's quite a stressful area to work in. And I think we, we see all the time that CISOs are leaving. We see that it's only kind of a two-year time frame. And we see that we talk about burnout and all those things. And I I think because you deal with life and death in the military and you deal with very difficult kind of environments and, and it's all about teamwork, I think maybe running a, a, a kind of a, a security team in in real life, we'll call it, is easier than what you've dealt with in the past. Um, but, but John, I'll, I'll let you ask something. Yeah, so talk to me a little bit about I, your background in the military was human intelligence. Um, how have you been able to kind of leverage that in your roles? Uh, and, and talk to me about progressing because, uh, you know, you started off as an analyst and then, you know, ran a SOC and now in the CISO role. How has that background uh, helped you in your your progression. I mean, frankly, I've been I've been blessed. I mean, there's really no other way to say it. I'm not going to take credit for for a lot of it. I think ultimately, though, what it what it taught me uh, in the intel world, you know, as you collect your disparate pieces of information, your goal is to build context. Your goal is to understand the why. And I think part of that is building alignment with the business, right? I mean, it's. It's not the day, this day and age, you can't really get away with the office of no anymore. You just can't. And so when you, in order to get that context, in order to understand why the business wants what it wants, right? It's not about shutting them down anymore. It's about how do we help them succeed? It's, it's reversing that, that notion. And I think, you know, thinking outside the box, how many people in, in cyber have grown up in cyber and have been raised and assimilated into a culture and where, where that was the box that they knew. And I think that's why we're seeing such a big push right now for diversity of thought, not just diversity itself, which is also important, but diversity of thought. What can that add to the team? Because if, if all you have is one idea, 
you don't know if it's the best one. And so I think coming from a different background, coming from a different environment, coming from a different approach to problem solving, you know, the, yes, I was an analyst in, in the military, which was a very different idea from being an analyst in, in the sock space, right? How do you take those and translate that into the cyber world and build those relationships and, and tackle the people problem? We have a lot of phenomenal technical minds in the cyberspace, but I still think that one of our biggest gaps are the are the the social skills, the ability to network, the ability to build relationships, as and and frankly the ability to to lead. And what I mean by that is, we have a bad habit historically of promoting people to leadership, assuming they'll be a good leader if they were technically sound, and we're not doing a good enough job developing the leadership skills on the other side of the house. You are dead on in that. Um, so. What so so say you're looking at somebody for a leadership role. Um, they have a very good technical background, but maybe their user interface is is not as polished as <laughs> you might expect. Um, and we see that a lot in IT because honestly, you know, the technical people love to work on technical things. Um, and you know that use that uh, user interface may not get exercised as much as as we may like. But if you're bringing somebody in and you see potential, how do you help coach them up? Uh, can you give me some examples of have you done that in the past? The biggest thing I try to do is reframe the narrative. Right? There's this narrative in our environment that you have to be super technically sound to be a good leader. And it's all connected. The technical aspect is connected to leadership. And there's undoubtedly some aspect of connection there for sure. Absolutely. But it's not as, as closely intertwined, I believe anyway, as, as the general culture believes it is. So I'm a big sports guy, right? And Jay's not going to understand any of this because he's in the <laughs> UK and they don't appreciate really good sports like American football. But if you were to take if you were to take an American football team, take somebody like one of our, our most famous coaches out there, probably the, the unanimous best coaches, whether it's Bill Belichick or Andy Reid, like these top minds in the coaching area, right? Their job isn't to be the best quarterback. And their job isn't to be the wide receiver or the running back or any of the positional elements on the field. That's not their job. Their job is to understand those positions enough to maximize the ability of those players to perform in their roles and to leverage the strengths on their team, whatever those strengths are, to work with the team and craft a strategy to go win the Super Bowl with the talent that they have. So it's a very different way of looking at the problem, right? You're taking somebody who's used to trying to be the best quarterback or the best running back or the best wide receiver into somebody who understands that it's a much bigger picture. And the goal of the leader is to tie the strengths of that team together to go win the championship, right? So it's, like, it's the idea of stepping back. It's the idea of not having your personal ego associated with being the most technical person on the team. Because frankly, in my opinion, the leader probably shouldn't be the most technical person on the team. Because if they are, you're wasting that talent. That's a that's an excellent analogy. And and I think I've seen it as I grew in my career. Uh, the the further you go up the chain, the more abstracted you become from the, the challenges on the front line. But you have to have that ability to dive down and I'll say it. Uh, be able to call bullshit on some of the stuff because yeah. technical people will come in and they'll start tout touting technical terms, uh, trying to kind of snow job you a little bit. Uh, so you kind of get out of their way, but um, the ability to detect that and look at it and go, all right, so let's dive deeper and dive deeper, ask, you know, five why questions and try to get to where we really are is, is critical. So that uh, ability to inquiry and, um, and and talk and, and get down and, and really find where the problem is is, is critical. Um, you also brought up another thing around diversity of thought. Uh, I kind of want to dive into that a little bit uh, because I had a similar success, I think that then as as you did in developing a team that um, had a lot of diversity in it. And the reason I did that was I wanted people who weren't going to be yes people. I wanted people who were going to push me, push my thoughts. Uh, and, and if I was going in a direction that wasn't correct, were willing to call me on it. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how, you know, for people out there, how do you kind of build that team and, and, and what to look for? I mean, for me, first and foremost, I think diversity itself is really important, right? Because we have to, it's it's the easiest in, in many ways the, the the quickest way to balance your team's thought process. Uh, 
at the same time, though, it does not necessarily mean that you are sticking with the traditional norms of diversity. And what I mean by that is, what about socioeconomic? You know, one of the things that I've found are those that are raised in really privileged environments that never had to work, never had to hustle or have the street smarts, they have a very different type of skill set and thinking process than those who grew up in an extremely poor household and had to figure out their their social environment on the streets and, and essentially hustle to get by and read the room in order not to get beat up or, or whatever, right? So I think, or, or take a stay-at-home mom. These, these parents who have raised a house full of kids who have done all of the program management of running kids to and fro and managing all of the schedules, the lunches, the team meetings, the sports events, the drama club plays, choir, all of that stuff, right? It's amazing how well that kind of skill set translates into an environment where maybe they don't have the technical skill sets as much as you would like, but what they do bring is such a good value that you have the time and value to wait until they build a more complete skill set. I mean, generally speaking, I much prefer the intangibles because from a DEI perspective or diversity of thought perspective, I want the ideas, right? That's my goal. My goal is the ideas because the reality is you can have a pretty diverse team in a traditional sense that isn't very diverse from a thought process. If all of your team was raised in the in the same socioeconomic level, in the same industry, in the same town, you're not going to have as much diversity of thought, right? You really have to challenge to, to bring in people that haven't been raised with your culture, maybe, or your way of thinking, or the way you thought. To your point, Jay, John, you want people to, to call you out and give competing ideas. I mean, I always go back to my, my, my idea that if all you have is that one idea, you have nothing to compare it with. How do you know it's the best one? How do you compare and contrast it so that you can do the best thing you you know for your team? See, I, I've spent a lot of time recruiting people over the last couple of years and, well, throughout my career. And, and there's a big push at the moment for people to get qualifications and to get certifications. I used to try and avoid people that had just RAFT certifications because they were all just being cloned. They would learn to answer the same question with the same answer. And I was trying to avoid that. So I actively chose people that kind of learned from doing, had home labs, had those things. Because anybody that, say, had an MCP or an MCSE or some kind of Cisco certification had learned the answer to the questions in the same way. And I wonder if we're going down the same route. I mean, the, the, there's CISO certifications. There's a whole bunch of them. I wonder if everyone doing the CISSP or any of those all just come out with the same mindset. And actually, for me, having that diversity, and as John said, having those people that will challenge the norms are critical because in, in the face of a disaster, you want people to be thinking of all the different possible ways of which you can get out of the, the situation. And if we're all going down the same road, we just end up with a traffic jam. Um but anyway, I, I, I'd like to ask about zero trust. I mean, we hear about it in the press all the time. Obviously, you've got the executive order in the US. You've got a lot of stuff going on over there. Um, is it something you're hearing a lot about? And do you think it's just a buzzword or do you think it's going to kind of evolve into something else? So I'll be honest. I think it's probably going to evolve into multiple something else's. It's been so distorted, I think over time and everybody has used it for everything. You know, in 2019, I went to black hat and almost nobody was there. It was the deadest I'd ever seen that, that program. And at one point when I was a little bit, or had some downtime, I went around the floor and I went to, I think nine different booths that claim they did zero trust. Yeah. And just for kicks, I asked each of them to define it for me. And I wrote down their definitions and every single one was completely different. Right. So I think this idea is zero trust has been sold widely, but it has not been there. There is no industry wide recognized adoption of a single definition for what it even means. So I think we really have to be more honest about it internally, right? We don't want to mislead people. If I go and tell my leadership team, we're doing zero trust. I have to be really careful, right? Cause what does that mean for us? What does that mean for Avnet? Because if they, you know, what it means to me is going to be very different potentially. As I mean, I'm a I'm a global environment manufacturing, you know, supply chain type space. 
we have a lot of legacy stuff, hybrid environment. It's going to be very different than say a startup in a pure SaaS cloud type environment, completely yep. different, right? If you have a, I mean, a lot of these newer startups don't even have a, a, an enterprise network, right? They're completely BYOD, remote to the cloud. What it looks like for them and for us, completely different. So I would prefer we discuss zero trust in a, what are we really trying to accomplish, right? Are we trying to accomplish least privilege? Are we trying to accomplish modern access? I think that's the term that we've kind of landed on at Avnet is, is really, we're, we want to try to do modern access. But I, I think to, kind of to your point, it's, it's, a buzzword it's and somebody went and got their you know leadership role on the sales side of the house from coming up with it at some point but it does in, in i guess at its base level explain what we're trying to do and that is we don't want to have that implicit trust anymore right we want to make sure that only the people that have permission to access a, a, a part of the network can access that part of the network yeah and i think that's key i mean we we met at rsa um last year um, and again, me and John walked around RSA and, and, and every vendor w was selling zero trust. Um, and I, I don't believe it, it's a product that you can buy off the shelf. I, I, I think kind of at its core, it's a good idea. I think, as you said, um, restricting access, giving people access, just what they need access to and not the whole network is in, is gonna obviously help. I mean, we've for however many years given people access to everything and just trusted them not to not to do things and and there's too many threat actors and too much going on right now for us to do that so i think it does need to change but it's not a product that you're just gonna go and pick off the shelf i mean there are products that will help you yes but i think it's a cultural change it's a mindset mindset change and i think it fits quite well into that kind of diversity and different way of thinking um, it's a totally different approach to how we historically solved a problem. Yeah. And this idea that one tool will solve it, it's not it's not an accurate conception. No. Right? You, if, you're, if your configurations aren't squared away, if your identity isn't squared away, if your you know, security posture at large isn't really squared away to begin with, you're going to have a really hard time even moving into that space. So yeah, I it, it's, I, it's one part of the pie. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think it's, as you were saying, if you're kind of a, a SaaS company, it'll be a lot easier I've historically worked in global manufacturing companies. I've dealt with regulations all over the globe. I've dealt with the unions and everything else that's going on and, and all kinds of restrictions. And it, it's going to be difficult in those kind of companies. And it, it's not going to be an overnight, let's go and buy this product, let's, let's implement it. And I think that, that for me, that's the biggest concern is people are going to get, they're going to go to Black Cat, they're going to go to RSA, they're going to go to these conferences, they're going to go back, they're going to buy a product, and then they're going to go, well, it didn't work how we wanted it to. Um, but John, is there anything else you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, let's let's get into it. Uh, regulations. So we're starting to hear, obviously, with the Biden executive order on zero trust. We don't know what that means. It's uh, we'll, we'll see what that turns out to be. The federal government runs very slow. But we're also starting to see local uh, or statewide regulations or regulators start to get involved in um, the story as well. Um, and a lot of it's tied to, and, and a great example of this is the New York uh, Department of Financial Services. I don't think that Avnet falls under it, but it is interesting that they're coming out with a more prescriptive approach to cybersecurity. Uh, and it, the driver was the rise of ransomware, uh, they also in New York had a, a hack that uh, a lot of PII got out and the regulators were like, hey, this is getting a little out of control. Um, I'm curious from your perspective, uh, do you see that government coming in or regulators coming in are going to change the tune in terms of cybersecurity or uh, should we leave it to the market to kind of figure this out? Uh, the amount of hacking that's going on, the damage to businesses uh, that they may step up their game because at some point something's got to give. I think the train has left the building, John. I mean, if you look at just, you know, the other day, I mean, if, actually it was a few months ago now, I just went through a whole bunch of headlines that had happened just since I started at Avnet in the past year. And it just blew my mind that I didn't even have enough room on a slide to put them all because of how much, how many new regulations are being coming out and being proposed, whether it's state led, state led. I mean, just this past week, you know, Illinois is going after people for the biometric 
collection as part of their security programs without adequately notifying users. I mean, from a privacy perspective, the United States is a complete mess. I mean, at least in the UK, you guys have all kind of agreed on GDPR for the most part. In the US, it's state by state. You know, we have the Biden stuff coming out at some point, who knows when. If it's anything like the CMMC regulations, it's going to be a mess as well, right? Right now, you know, we're going through CMMC, but that's going to be a mandate. We've been told clearly it is, but the government still hasn't decided how we even report an incident if there is an incident regarding the CMMC program. So the government is putting requirements out there before fully getting behind on themselves. You know, they're, they're trying to get ready quickly, moving more, moving more, probably more quickly than they have in the past, but still slower than their own requirements. And now we have, you know, coming March, we have the SEC regulations where every company in the U.S. is going to have to disclose the tech savviness of their board as well as the level of oversight the board has over cybersecurity specifically. I mean, it's it's raining down. And and there's a, you know, I kind of have mixed, mixed views on that. I think, I wonder actually whether it's going to essentially create a, a lower ceiling for cyber programs. In other words, if the government has all of these requirements out, is that government going to be seen as the expert for what's needed and essentially the authority on what's needed such that companies don't innovate beyond that, right? This whole idea that some people have had historically where compliance is security that I completely disagree with, right? Compliance is the, the very minimum you can get away with. It's not security. But I fear that if the, as a government gets more and more into what is required from a security perspective, it'll have some benefit in raising the floor, but potentially limit the ceiling of what a lot of us at the enterprise level can build if that government authority, if that government is seen as the authority for what's needed. So how does, how do you, I mean, you're in a, in a role where you're a leadership role, you're interacting with the board. Um, how does that conversation go when the, you know, you're talking to the CEO, the board, Hey, we've got to spend X on security because of this, this, and this. Um, are they open to listening to it or is it a risk thing? Or they're like, Hey, we don't want to invest in that. Uh, how does that conversation go in? Are there recommendations you can give to other CISOs in that role? Uh, how can they be successful in their security program? Because to your point, what you said earlier, there's a lot of, um, hey, you know, uh, sky's falling, we're the department of no. Um, how do you kind of change the game in that conversation? Well, I mean, I think the first thing you have to do is be realistic. You know, if if you have gaps, it doesn't do any good as a security leader to put lipstick on a pig, for lack of a better term. And, and gloss over it because if those gaps are later leveraged or exploited, then you know it's it's going to you're going to lose trust with the business. So I think the first thing is to be honest, not fud, right? You want to avoid any of the fud. Be realistic, but don't don't go out there and and make everything a crisis. So that I say the first step is being honest. The second step is speaking in a language that is understood by the business. You know, going back to this idea that we we. Even those of us like myself who aren't as tech savvy as, as most CISOs at, at the detail level probably still speak in a you know far too tech speak far too often. We have to get better at translating what we're doing to business language and the language they understand, which is money, right? How do we impact the revenue? How do we play a role in the process? Are we part of the sales team or, or, the, or, the, or the, uh, the company team that's supporting this revenue coming in? Or are we an insurance policy, right? And I think it's it's on us to build those relationships and break it down into a simplified manner that the board understands. But I will say that I think different boards have different love languages, so to speak, right? Every day they say that everybody has different love languages. I think it's the same with boards. Some boards want more details. Some want a risk-based approach. And I think part of the key is aligning with your board on what they want to see, right? If your board wants to see something, show it to them. Right. It's it's not worth the fight. I mean, I had a historically, I'll give a real example for me. Vanity metrics are vanity metrics. Right. To me, I like metrics that are I can use to, to measure progress. I like metrics that I can use specifically to drive change and improvements. But in my experience over numerous roles, not even just my current one, I have found that vanity metrics are something that senior executives like to see. Right? They like to see what the what the tools are doing on their own, how many bots that we're blocking or how many 
you know, emails that were blocking stuff that at my level, right. The value isn't as much to me, but it's something that I think it's easier to understand sometimes the, the vanity metrics are a little bit easier to understand sometimes easier to consume easier to see that there's stuff being done at an executive level and i've talked to peers who refuse to participate in that and frankly i don't understand it right if my leadership team wants to see security stuff we're going to share it with them for the most part now we want to make sure that, that they understand what they see we present you know we have glossaries that break it down as well as we can but at every role that i've been at you know the goal is to align with what their language is not to force yours on them. And if, and if you want to bring in something new, you need to find a way to educate and, and align on that new message, but it's not, this, this should never be an us versus them, right? That board is the one that has your back. It's the one that supports resourcing your program. And so it's really important to maintain that alignment. So a, a lot of what you've just said for me means building a good relationship with the board and, and with, with those peers. And, and that takes time to, to kind of foster those relationships. And it takes time to understand what they want. And you were just saying there that give the board what they want, but that's going to take time to understand. And you were also saying they've all got different love languages. That's going to take time to understand. But if we flip the coin, CISOs last about 18 months to two years on average in companies. And there's statistics, and John will have to correct me. Um, I think it's something like it takes nine months for them to to kind of get into the job and start doing a, a, doing a good job. So why do you think that is? Why do you think that even though it takes time, and it reminds me, and I'm going to give you an analogy about proper football, not American football, but we quite often get managers will come into the team and they'll be they'll be they'll get three or four matches or five matches and then they'll be fired because they haven't been able to make a change. Most common sense will tell you you can't make a change in like a month or two months, especially when you're working with a team that you haven't you haven't picked the team. You don't know how they play. You want to do things differently. So if you're a you're a, a CISO coming into a new company, and I I read something on LinkedIn the other day that was you, that you need to make a change or or need to be able to make a difference within thirty days. I'm like, well, it will take you longer than that to figure out what the hell is going on in the company. So so for me. The first thing I would do coming into a company was learn everyone around me, learn people that work for me, then learn the board and learn the senior management and then start making relationships and then trying to kind of get them to trust you. And then once they've trusted you, you, you can make change. That's going to take time. Do you think that people are leaving because they're not given enough opportunity to make those changes? Or is it just because they're being pulled away because there's more money in it or something else. What, what, what do you think? I suspect it's probably a combination, right. Of a lot of things. I suspect part of it is that uh, going back to my leadership thing, right. Going back to people, how many people are in that CISO role because they were super technical and how many are of those people are getting out because they don't necessarily have the, the skill sets or background to do things like roadmaps that they can deliver on project management skills, things like that. I mean, to be honest, engineers, some of the most brilliant people I've ever met, right. But also some of the hardest people to keep on task because when you can fix everything you can, so you do. Right. And so look, changing your mindset from that to one of, I have to build a roadmap that I can stick to, that I can deliver on, that I can sell the team on, that I can sell leadership on. So I think part of the challenge is, is we have to do expectation management with leadership and make sure that they're on the same page, right? If they don't know what, what's in your space, if they don't know what your challenges are, if they don't know where your gaps are, then they're going to probably have expectations that you can't meet. And they might anyway, right? But the, it's our job. I feel it's our job, not their job necessarily, although maybe meeting in the middle would be good, but it's primarily our job, especially in this new environment where we're trying to become more of a business enabler versus just that, you know, dungeon in the basement yeah, to be out there and show and prove our value in a language that they understand. This, this goes back to that trust issue. So come in, if you're coming into a new role, yes, there's a lot of those things you have to do to start learning, especially like in my current role with a company like Avnet, where I think the average tenure is what, 15, 20 years. I mean, it's one of those places like Garmin's another one that's famous for how long people come and stay. It takes a while to learn the culture and to learn how things work because when everybody's been there for so long, the tribal knowledge is where most of that knowledge sits, right? 
So in, in a situation like that, the, yes, you're going to take time to learn people. You're going to take time to learn the environment. But I think anybody going into a new role should be able to put a 90 day plan together pretty quickly. And then from that nine part of that, and then part of that 90 day plan is, okay, we've been here 90 days. We've learned the, the main players. We've learned some of the hot spots. We know where our major gaps are. Now we put our roadmap together. But even a roadmap, right? You want to have that roadmap that you can sell and share and track. But things are going to change. Kind of going back to your point, Jay, you're going to learn new things. You're going to have, find blind spots you didn't know about, the unknown unknowns that are in an organization. So you also have to be have the courage to fail fast. If something's not working or if you have a new priority, change your roadmap. But you have to make sure you translate that and are transparent in order to build the trust with those that are going to empower you to do so. And I, I think that's critical. I mean, you said something there that changed the roadmap. I mean, I, I in the early days of my career, I, I, I worked for somebody that created a roadmap. He'd only just come in the company, he'd created a roadmap. He went around, flew around the world and realized that the roadmap didn't make sense. But it was like, it's my roadmap, I'm sticking to it. And it's like, well, you've now realized we're going in completely the wrong direction. Like we've, we... <laughs> so you've got to be able to adjust and and. The threat landscape's adjusting and, and changing all the time. I mean, we're, it's like putting fingers in the dam, right? You, you block one hole, you find another hole. You block that hole, you find another hole. And um, I mean, ransomware is what we're talking about a lot at the moment. I mean, we see it out there a lot. We see that the the, the cost of ransomware is ever increasing. Um, I wonder what you think is going to happen over the next, say, one to three years. Do you think ransomware is still going to be on top of people's minds or do you think we'll get to the point where we kind of got that under control and something else kind of pops out of that hole in the dam? That's a good question. I mean, the bad guys aren't going away, let's be honest. Yeah. And, and one of my concerns is with the current economic downturn that we're seeing and all of these layoffs happening, many of which are security teams that we're going to see an uptick actually for a while, right? Because this is, this goes back to sometimes the business, not, grasping this concept. I mean, they, they want to cut costs. They want to save costs. And, and I get it, right? It's it's important for us to align with the business, but we have to do a better job explaining that just because the economy goes down doesn't mean the bad guys go away, right? So how do we balance that with the business interests? So I suspect we'll probably see some uptick, but even in the last year, for example, we've seen fewer ransomware attacks in your historically big areas, right? Finance, yeah. healthcare, because they were the ones that were targeted for years already. And so they're getting their defenses put in order. But in, in, in industries like mine, manufacturing supply chain space, we're seeing an increase. Why? Because everybody else was being targeted. And historically, it was like, well, why do we need all this security stuff? We're, nobody cares about us, right? We're not this big bank. We're not this big hospital. Why would they care? But now they care because we're the low-hanging fruit, right? Yeah. So we're seeing an increase in, in some of these industries. I think we're going to see a much bigger increase in the IoT environment. In fact, we already are in many areas, right? If you look at the industry trends, why? Because that's a low-hanging fruit. And I think we're going to continue to see that. I mean, it's, it's that old notion of you don't have to be fast to escape a bear, right? You just have to be faster than the slowest person. And, and eventually all of the slow people will be eaten and it'll be back up to you again. So I, I don't know. I mean, long-term, they're going to have to find something new, right? We have a lot of really amazing technology coming out. Eventually, companies are going to get their act together because they're, they're going to get sick of paying ransoms and and paying for this stuff. But I, I wonder, it's, it's a cat and mouse game. Yep. And, and right now, I'm curious what comes next. I mean, I remember 10 years ago getting into this, exploit kits were all the rage, right? And now it's and now it's ransomware. What's next? And I'm, I'm curious to see what happens. I think one of the biggest issues we have right now is is supply chain i think that's why manufacturers are being targeted and and i think supply chains maybe in in banking and finance aren't quite the same i mean i've worked for large manufacturers pretty much all my career and we would deal from large suppliers to to one man band suppliers doing a little bit of thing that was 25 years old or 50 years old and we needed it it only takes one person in that chain to be compromised right. and we're all going to get eaten basically um and I think, therefore, it becomes an easy target because Avnet's a large company. You have some budget you can spend on security. But if you're dealing with someone that's a five-person company somewhere else in the world and they get compromised and, and somehow you trust them a little bit because they've been a supplier for 50 years and you don't necessarily need to treat them like you would anybody else and suddenly you've been attacked. Mm. I mean, that was always my biggest concern, working for 
for my last company, we were, like I said, we were a manufacturer, but we had sites in Romania and India and places like that where the thought of security wasn't necessarily like it would be in, in the rest of the West. So it, oh, yeah. they got targeted a bit more. Um, I've lost train of thought. So, John, you, you ask a question. <laughs> yeah, so let's, let's, move on. let's move on to some of the other funner questions. Um, being a CISO is, is, a, is a tough role. We talked about it. Uh, burnout is an issue. Um, but I'm curious, uh, what do you do to kind of uh, relax? What do you do in your downtime to kind of burn off that stress and, and get your mind straight? Uh, so I live on a 25 acre farm. I have a whole passel of kids. We raise exotic animals. I don't, I'm not the guy that goes home and plays video games, right? For me, I actually really enjoy my work to be fair. I mean, for me, if, if I'm working late, it's because I enjoy it. I, I just, I'm pretty passionate about building programs and, and what I do, but at the same time, I don't, you know, that work-life balance is important. So for me, it's generally my kids. We'd like to go out. We let, we have a, big property we dirt every one of my kids rides dirt bikes we're very outdoorsy nice. family we don't have cable or satellite tv i mean we're not we're not like that right and so for me it's that's really the priority um outside of outside of the office that's so a exotic, real good escape i mean that's I gonna say yeah go on john ex exotic animals i know we had a conversation on one uh <laughs> do you want to do you want to dive in a little bit to that we, we raise a, a bunch of really cool things like uh, ringtail cats, which are the smallest member of the raccoon family, uh, furry dogs, which anybody in the Midwest the United States will know as those things that pop out of the ground everywhere. Uh, things, we raise all sorts of stuff like that. We have pigs, we have a mini cow, we have, it's, it's just a small operation, right? But we re it's really important for us and for our kids to, to learn what it's like to have some responsibility, to care for other things. And, and we have found that compared to a lot of the other kids that we see these days which are unfortunately being babysat by video games 24 7 it seems like and their phones and things like that in public i, I feel that having kids that have no responsibility they, they seem to be maturing faster and so i'm hoping that will lead ultimately to more success for them yeah and i i think that's pretty critical i mean when you look at society now and and, and my girlfriend said this to me we, we went to london zoo it was my birthday um a, a, a week or so ago we went to London Zoo, and I like zoos. I mean, it's a small zoo, city zoo, but there were children walking around at the zoo just looking at their phones. They weren't looking at the animals. They had no interest. And the amount of people that couldn't recognize a monkey, and I don't necessarily mean the type of monkey because there are so many, <laughs> and it's really hard because there are hundreds of different like little maca uh, little tamarins all the way up to like gorillas. But when you've got a child of like, nine or 10 years old that doesn't know what a monkey looks like i'm thinking society is a little bit wrong somewhere i mean yeah. and all you've done is sat there looking at your phone um but i have a question about food be before sure. we move on i'm a massive food person you may have you guessed too. when i met you we were having lunch and it was quite a good burger um I, I started off asking this question a little bit differently i would ask people what their favorite meal was and i've kind of pivoted a little bit to say what has been your favorite meal? But not necessarily because of the food, but because of the experience. Mm. It, like, is it been a, in a, a great view? Was it with certain people? What What was it like? What was the whole food experience? I'll call call it. I think my favorite food. Ex I'm a big foodie. My wife and I we love food. Or the we don't really like the chain type of food, right? We yep. want to go find that hole in the wall that just has something brilliant. But uh, a few years back, we went down to Puerto Vi Puerto Vallarta. And learned that that is the number one destination outside of the U.S. where Michelin star restaurants or Michelin star chefs trial new concepts. Nice. And uh, we literally spent the week going like down number one to number ten for all of the TripAdvisor and best ranked restaurants. So we're getting like these nine course meals with drinks and everything. Walking out the door for like a hundred bucks for two of us. It was a wild experience. But some of the best food I think I've ever had that week was testing all of these or eating at all of these concept locations as these chefs trialed them down in Mexico. Yeah. See, I've had one of my greatest meals in Mexico and it, we, we, my old company used to have a site there. Um, and for, for whatever reason, the road was closed one morning and, and we took a bit of a back route and we came across a breakfast burrito place. And mm. it was literally somebody had opened up the back of the house and was selling these burritos. Um, we were a little bit nervous about getting them, but we did. We stopped the car, went out and got some. One of the best meals I've ever had. And 
I've searched ever since then to find that same place and I've never been able to find it because it was in Mexicali somewhere and oh, wow. every road felt the same and I just couldn't find it. Um, but John, before we wrap, one last question from you. I don't really have any questions. I was just going to add on uh, in Portland, we call those places food trucks. So <laughs> same. Actually, in, it's, in yeah. Kansas City right now where I'm living, my favorite restaurant right now is a barbecue joint that started last year in the parking lot of a local brewery. And it's a food truck and the food that they make, because there's they don't have refrigeration or freezers. They don't have that ability. So everything is either smoked or flash fried or but they don't they have no cold storage to speak of. So it's uh it's, it's again, food trucks are well underrated. Yeah. Some of the most creative chefs in order to work, you know, build what they build in such a small area and do it consistently is just brilliant. So I, I yeah. had a, a meal recently from a double decker bus. Um, so it was a London double decker bus for whatever reason, it was in Manchester and not in London uh, and they'd converted it into a, a burger restaurant. Oh, wow. And it was incredible. I mean, it was, I, I got talking to the young guy that was the chef and it was his idea. He wanted to create kind of a chain restaurant and he started off making these burgers kind of in his back garden but then he needed somewhere for people to sit. So he bought this double decker bus and fitted it out with a kitchen. And I think now he's opened the actual restaurant in Manchester. Um, so, oh, wow. so it was great. Um, That's awesome. I'd really like to thank you for coming along. I mean, myself and John are hoping to try and get to RSA and Black Cat again. So if you happen to be at one or the other, I'd love to buy you a beer or a burger, or we can talk food, talk barbecue. Um, but it's been sure. great. And and every time we have one of these conversations, I look down at the clock and think how, how, time's just flown past um but it was a really good conversation john anything from you before we wrap no it's always great to share some time with with garrick it's <laughs> we've met a few times uh otherwise and it, it's always a great conversation likewise gentlemen thank you very much